Chapter 9 of The Revolt on Venus. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Revolt on Venus by Carrie Rockwell. Chapter 9 Rocket Cruiser Polaris to Solar Guard Venus Port. Request emergency relay circuit to Commander Walters and route Earth. On the radar bridge of the Polaris, Roger Manning spoke quickly into the teleceiver microphone. Just a few minutes before the giant spaceship had blasted off from Venusport, heading for the Sinclair Plantation, Major Connell had ordered Roger to get in touch with Walters to report the latest security leak. On the control deck, the Major paced back and forth restlessly as Tom guided the Polaris on its short flight. I'll find the spy in the Solar Guard if I have to tear Venus Port apart piece by piece, fumed Connell. What about that jet freighter we took away from the Nationalists, sir? asked Tom. Did you ever find out where it came from? Connell nodded. It was an old bucket on the Southern Colonial Run. She was reported lost last year. Somehow these jokers got a hold of her and armed her to the teeth. You think maybe the crew could have mutinied, sir? It's highly possible, Corbett, answered Connell, and glanced around. If they have any other ships of that size, the Polaris will be able to handle them. Yes, sir. Tom smiled. The repair crew did a good job on her. The cadet paused. Do you suppose one of the Nationalists planted that bomb on her fin? No doubt of it, replied Connell. And it seems to tie in with a rather strange thing that happened in the Venusian delegate's office the day before it happened. What was that, sir? asked Tom. Three priority orders for seats aboard a Venusport Adam City Express were stolen. Before a check could be made, the ship had made its run and the people using the priorities were gone. They must have been the ones that bumped you off your seats. How do you think that ties in with the bomb on the Polaris, sir? We're trying to figure that out now, said Connell. If we only knew what they looked like, it would help. The girl at the ticket office doesn't remember them, and neither does the ship's stewardess. But we saw them, sir, exclaimed Tom. You what? roared Connell. Yes, sir. We were standing there at the ticket counter when they called for their tickets. Do you think you'd recognize them again? I'll say, asserted Tom. And I'm sure Astro and Roger would, too. We were so mad we could have blasted them on the spot. Connell turned to the intercom and shouted, Manning, haven't you got that circuit through yet? Working on it, sir. Roger's voice was smooth and unruffled over the intercom. I'm in contact with the commander's ship now. They're calling him to the radar bridge now. Tom suddenly jumped out of his seat as though stung. Say... I saw one of the fellows again, too. Connell whirled quickly to face the young cadet. Where? He demanded. Where did you see him? I... I'm trying to remember. Tom began pacing the deck, snapping his fingers impatiently. It was some time during the past few days. I know it was. In Venusport? Demanded Connell, following Tom around the deck. Yes, sir. Before or after your trip into the jungle? Uh, before, I think. Tom replied hesitantly. No. No, it was after we came back. Well, out with it, Corbett, exploded the Major. When? Where? You didn't do that much visiting. You were too tired to move. That's just it, sir, said Tom, shaking his head. I was so tired, everything was a blur. Faces were all mixed up. I... I... The boy stopped and put his hands to his head as though trying to squeeze the one vital face out of his hazy memory. Connell kept after him like a hungry, stalking animal. Where, Corbett? When? He shouted. You've got to remember! This is important! Think blast you! I'm trying, sir, replied the cadet. But it just won't come to me. The buzz of the intercom suddenly sounded, and Connell reluctantly left Tom to answer it. Roger's voice crackled over the speaker. I have Commander Walters now, sir. Feeding him down to the control deck teleceiver. Oh, all right, replied Connell, and turned to Tom. Come on, Corbett. I want you to report to the commander personally. Yes, sir, replied Tom, walking slowly to the teleceiver. I'm sorry I can't remember where I saw that man. Forget it, Connell said gruffly. It'll come back to you again sometime. He paused and then added as gently as he could. Sorry I blasted you like that. When Commander Walter's face appeared on the teleceiver screen, Connell reported the incident of the cab driver and the news that Tom, Roger, and Astro had seen the three men who had taken the priorities on the Venus Lark. Just a minute, said Walters. I'll have a recorder take down the descriptions. 
Connell motioned to Tom, who stepped before the screen. When he saw Walter's nod, he gave a complete description of the three men he had seen in the Atom City spaceport. Let's see now, said Walters after Tom had concluded his report. The man who asked for the tickets was young, about twenty-two, dressed in Venusian clothing, dark, six feet tall, weighed about one hundred and fifty pounds, right? Yes, sir, replied Tom. Connell suddenly stepped before the screen to interject. And Corbett saw him in Venusport again sometime during the last two days. Really? Where? Connell glanced at Tom and then replied hurriedly. Well, he can't be sure, sir. We rushed him around pretty fast and he saw a lot of people. But at least we know he's in Venusport somewhere. Yes, sir. Nodded Walters. That's something to work on, at least. And you have nothing more to add to the descriptions of the other two, Corbett? Not anything particular, sir, said Tom. They were dressed in Venusian-type clothes also, but we didn't get a close look at them. Very well, said Walters. Proceed with your mission, Major. I'll have an alert sent out for the cab driver, and I'll have the owner of the pawn shop picked up. There must be someone on the Solar Delegate's staff who stole those priorities. We'll start searching there first. And if we come up with anyone who can't explain his absence from Venusport at the time the priorities were used, and fits Corbett's description, we'll contact you. End transmission. End transmission. Repeated Connell. The screen blanked out and Roger's voice came over the intercom immediately. We'll be over Sinclair's in three minutes. He called. Stand by. Tom turned to the controls and in exactly two minutes and fifty seconds the clearing surrounded Sinclair's home and the burned-out buildings came into view. Working effortlessly, with almost casual teamwork, the three cadets brought the giant spaceship to rest in the middle of the clearing. As the power was cut, the cadets saw George and Mrs. Hill jumping into a jet car and speeding out to greet them. After Tom introduced Connell to the couple, the Major questioned them closely about their absence during the attack by the shock troops. Mr. Sinclair often gives us time off for a trip into Venusport, explained Hill. It gets pretty lonely out here. Is Mr. Sinclair in now? asked Connell. No, he isn't, replied the plantation foreman. He's on his weekly trip around the outer fields. I don't expect him back for another day or two. For goodness sakes, exclaimed Mrs. Hill. You can ask your questions just as easily and a darn sight more comfortably in the house. Come on, let's get out of the sun. The small group climbed into the jet car and roared off across the clearing toward the house. The lone building left standing by the nationalists looked strange amid the charred ruins of the other buildings. In the house, the three cadets busied themselves with home-baked apple pie, which the housekeeper had brought out while Connell was telling George of the attack on the plantation. I've known about them all along, of course, said the foreman. But I never paid any attention to them. I just quit, like Mr. Sinclair, when they started all that tomfoolery about wearing uniforms and stuff. Well, said Connell, accepting a wedge of pie at Mrs. Hill's insistence. Now they've made the wrong move. Burning Sinclair's property and attacking an officer of the Solar Guard is going too far. What are you going to do about it? asked George. I'm not at liberty to say, Mr. Hill, replied Connell. But I can tell you this. When any person or group of persons tries to dictate to the Alliance, the Solar Guard steps in and puts a stop to it. Suddenly the silence of the jungle clearing was shattered by the roar of a single jet craft coming in for a landing. Without looking out the window, George smiled and said, There's Mr. Sinclair now. I know the sound of his jets. The group crowded out onto the front porch while George took the jet car and drove off to pick up his employer. A few moments later, Sinclair was seated before Connell, wiping his sweating brow and accepting a cool drink from Mrs. Hill. I was on my way to the north boundary when I saw your ship landing, explained Sinclair. At first I thought it might be those devils coming back, but then I saw the solar guard insignia on the ship and figured it might be you. He looked at Connell closely. Anything new, Major? Not yet, replied Connell. But you can rest assured that you won't be bothered by them again. Sinclair paused, eyeing the Major speculatively. You know, as soon as you left, I went over to talk to Al Sharkey. I was plenty mad and really blasted him, but he swears that he was in Venusport at the time and doesn't know a thing about the raid. Connell nodded. That's true. We checked on him. 
But while he might not have been in on the raid itself, there's nothing that says he didn't order it done. I doubt it, said Sinclair with a queer apologetic note in his voice. I am inclined to believe that it was nothing more than a bunch of the younger, more hot-headed kids in the organization. As a matter of fact, Sharkey told me he was quitting as president. Seems you fellows in Venusport scared him plenty. Not only that, but I heard him calling up the other planters, telling them what happened, and every one of them is chipping in to rebuild my plantation. Connell looked at the planter steely-eyed. So you think it was done by a bunch of kids, huh? Sinclair nodded. Wouldn't be surprised if they're not scared, too. Well, you are entitled to your opinion, Mr. Sinclair. And if the other planters are going to rebuild your buildings, that's fine and charitable of them. Suddenly, Connell's voice became harsh. That does not, however, erase the fact that a group of uniformed men, armed with parallel ray guns and with ships equipped with blasters, attacked you. Atomic blasters, Mr. Sinclair, are not bought at the local credit exchange. They are made exclusively for the Solar Guard. That bunch of hot-headed kids, as you call them, are capable of attacking any community, even ships of the Solar Guard itself. That is a threat to the peace of the solar system and must be stopped. Sinclair nodded quickly. Oh, I agree, Major. I agree. I'm just saying that... Connell stopped him. I understand, Mr. Sinclair. You're a peaceful man and want to keep your life peaceful. But my job is to ensure that peace. As long as a group of militant toughs like we had here are on the loose, you won't have peace. You'll have pieces. Tom, Roger, and Astro, sitting quietly and listening, felt like standing up and cheering as the Major finished. I know you can't tell me what you're going to do, Major Connell, said the planter. But I hope that you'll allow me to help in any way I can. Connell hesitated before answering. Thank you, Mr. Sinclair, but I'm not here officially now. And then he added, Nor in regard to the Nationalists. Sinclair's eyes lit up slightly. Oh? No. As you know, the cadets had quite a time with the Tyrannosaurus. They wounded it, and it still might be dangerous. That is, more dangerous than normally. I've got orders to track him down and finish him off. But I thought you said you were going to put a stop to this business with the Nationalists, said the planter. I said the Solar Guard would, Sinclair. Oh, yes. Mumbled Sinclair. Yes, the Solar Guard, of course. Connell got up abruptly. I would appreciate it if you would look after our ship, though, he said. I don't think we'll be longer than a week. Shouldn't be hard to track a Tyrannosaurus, especially if it's wounded. I suppose you have all the equipment you need? Said Sinclair. Yes, thank you. Replied Connell. Then, thanking Mrs. Hill for the refreshments, the burly spaceman and the three cadets said goodbye and left the house. An hour later, ready to strike off into the jungle, the Solar Guard officer took four of the latest model shock rifles out of the arms locker of the Polaris and gave one to each boy with extra ammunition. Never go after a giant with a pop gun, he said. It's a wonder you didn't kill yourselves with those old blasters you used, let alone kill a Tyranno. The three cadets examined the rifles closely and with enthusiasm. These are the latest Solar Guard issue, said Connell. When you pull that trigger, you release a force three times greater than anything put into a rifle before. Then, checking the Polaris and cutting all power, Connell removed the master switch and hid it. That's so no one will get any bright ideas while we're gone he explained as the boys watched curiously. You think someone might try to steal her, sir? asked Tom. You can never tell, Corbett, answered Connell noncommittally. Once again the three boys moved across the clearing toward the jungle wall. Astro took the lead as before, followed by Roger and Tom, and Connell brought up the rear. They moved directly to the spot where they had last seen the Tyrannosaurus, found the trampled underbrush and massive tracks, and moved purposefully into the dank, suffocating green world. The trail was plain to see. Where the boys once had to hack their way through the thick underbrush, the monster had created a path for them. The three cadets felt better about being back in the jungle with more reliable equipment, and joked about what they would do to the Tyrannosaurus when they saw it again. I thought you were supposed to be the homegrown Venusian hick that could manage in the jungle like that fairy tale character Tarzan. Roger teased Astro. Listen, you sleepwalking space Romeo, growled Astro. I know more about this jungle than you could learn in ten years, and I'm not foolish enough to battle with a tyranno with the odds on his side. I ran for a good reason. Boy, did you run, taunted Roger. You were as fast as the Polaris on emergency thrust. Knock off that rocket wash, roared Connell. 
The Nationalists might have security patrols in this area. They could hear you talking and blast you before you could bat an eyelash. Now keep quiet and stay alert. The three cadets quieted down after that, walking carefully, stepping around dead brush that might betray their presence. After working their way along the Tyrannosaurus's trail for several hours, Connell called a halt, and after a quick look at his compass, motioned for them to cut away from the monster's tracks. We'll start working around in a circle, he said. One day east, one south, west, and north. Then we'll move in closer to the heart of the circle and repeat the same procedure. That should cover a lot of ground in eight days. If anything is moving around out here, besides what should be here, we'll find it. From now on, we'll have a scout. Astro, you know the jungle. You take the point, about 500 yards ahead. If you see anything, signs of a patrol or any danger from the jungle, fall back and report. Don't try to do anything yourself. Four guns in a good position are better than one popping off by itself. Aye, aye, sir, said Astro. With a quick nod to Tom and Roger, he moved off through the jungle. In ten feet, he was invisible. In thirty seconds, his footsteps were lost in the thousands of jungle sounds around them. I'll take the lead now, said Connell. Corbett, you bring up the rear. All right, move out. From above, in the leafy roof covering the jungle, from the side, in the thick tangle of vines, and from below, in the thorny underbrush, the eyes of living things, jungle things, followed the movements of the three spacemen, perhaps wondering if these new beasts were a threat to their lives. End of chapter 9